Well, good morning. Good morning. What a wonderful day to celebrate here. I, I got to tell you, I love that picture, that wedding picture. I do too. I had to look twice. I, I'll be honest, I had to look twice. And go, that is Jan and Harold. Go ahead. But it's a beautiful thing too. It's a beautiful thing. Um, today I'm going to talk about the concept of being beloved. And that's a little... It's a word we see in the Bible, and you'll hear sometimes. You know, you will hear it uh, talking about someone who's passed away. Their beloved grandparents, or something like that. Or we'll hear at a wedding, dearly beloved, we are gathered here today. But what does it really mean? And I'm going to talk about that a little bit today. Before we get started, um, I just ask you if you would, just go to, go to the Lord in prayer with me here. Father, I thank you so much for this day that you've given us, Lord. I thank you for everyone gathered here today and the celebration that we're having. And Lord, I just pray that you give me the words that you want spoken at this time so that we can open our hearts and hear from you, to hear your word in the way that you want it. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, where do we find love today? True love, not False love. There's a lot of false love out there in the world. How much? How many? How many times do we see that? I mean, if you watch television or some of the other things on there, I don't watch any of those shows, but they have all these goofy. It's you know, when I was a kid, it was the dating game. That was as far as it went. I'm kind of dating myself. Now. Well, you're old, man. I'm That's... old. But now they've got all these weird things on. But love has has been lost somewhere in this world. I just, these are just. Five headlines I pulled off this morning off the news. Subway slain, 14-year-old stabbed to death in broad daylight. Kidnapping suspect killed on a rooftop during shootout with the police. More would abhor his abortion if they saw the barbarity of it, says former Planned Parenthood director. At least 19 dead in a pair of South African shootings. Mom springs into action as woman steals car from a child inside, with her children inside. That's, that's what those are headlines. That's what we're seeing. If you go past the politic jump, these are the things that we're seeing in the world today. I looked on the local South Dakota news. The, the, the hardest thing the Kelloland had was a 61-year-old. Uh, they said he had a collision with the church. Oh. Had some sort of medical emergency, ran into an old church building. That, that was it. Minor injuries, and they, they wrote him a ticket for no insurance. Uh, but that's South Dakota, thankfully. That's where we live. But if we look at these things that are going on in the world today, we're not seeing love necessarily expressed. And I think one of the reasons for that is that people don't know what love is. They don't feel love. If you don't learn it, if you don't feel it, if you don't know it, how are you going to ever express it? 1 John 4, 18-19 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. And this is a concept that's kind of been sitting, sitting in my head all week. How can people really love each other if they don't know what love is? And if they don't know God's love because God's love came first, how are they ever possibly going to know how to truly love someone else? It's a hard thing. And it's one of those things that if we're blessed to go to Sunday school and learn it as a child and grow up in that knowledge that God loves me, that's one thing. But so much of the world is not getting that anymore. And as, that, as the generations continue to, to roll along, we're seeing less and less and less love in the world. Less and less people who actually love each other and care about someone else or just give someone the benefit of the doubt just because they know that they're loved, that we're all loved by God. God's love began before we even began, individually. Here's Psalm 139. I love this one. Uh, David's talking about himself, and he says, For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You are, your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. This is the concept of God's love. 
Before we even were born, He knew us. Life itself is a miracle. There is nothing... That's the one thing that man has never been able to do is create matter out of nothing. But God can do that. And God can create us the way He wants us to be. And that's where I think people are missing love so much is because they don't understand God loves you no matter where you are or what you are. Because He started you. He created you. And I don't have any money in my wallet, but I, I saw an illustration that a pastor did I thought was really good. He had a $100 bill. I'm not sure what one of those looks like. I asked my wife, maybe she'll show me. Um, and he said this $100 bill, when it came out of the mint, was brand new. It was crisp, it was shiny, it was perfect. Over the years, it's been used for a lot of different things. Some good, not some not so good. That dollar bill might have been used for buying drugs, or buying pornography, or all sorts of things that are negative. But in the end, what's that dollar bill worth? Exactly what it was intended to be worth from the very beginning. We are the same way. No matter where we go, God loved us in the beginning before we even knew Him. And God loves us now. That doesn't change. God's love doesn't change. God's love never ends. John 3.16, we know that it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And then Lamentations 3.22 says, Because of the Lord's great love we are not consumed, for His compassions never fail. His love doesn't stop. That is the perfect love that we need to understand and the world needs to understand today. God loved us so much that He sent His Son, even though we were steeped in sin and there was nothing that we didn't deserve it. And He didn't deserve to die, but He chose to die for us because of love. And His love never stops. That is the beauty of God's love. Not only did it come before we did, not only did that love happen before we understood that He loved us, but in addition to that, it never stops. You cannot do anything to stop God's love. That's not possible. You cannot out -sin the love of God. Think about that concept. Psalm 103, 8 says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in love. We've talked about this a lot before. We've talked about God's love and what God does for us. But I want to go into it just a little bit deeper here. What is... Love comes from God. That's where it starts. 1 John 4, 7-12. This is the uh, verse I put in the very first screen there. Dear friends, John wrote the Gospel and then the books of John. And he's known as... Those are known as the love books. Because that's in John, the way John talks. When it says, dear friends, in other translations it says, beloved. Let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed His love amongst us. He sent His one and only Son into the world, that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we, ought, we ought, also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and His love is made complete in us. That is the role that we have been given by God. God's intention was that we love each other. I'm going to give you this love. I'm going to show you love. Now you take it and go somewhere with it. Because if we are followers of Christ, that's who we're meant to be. Now there's a difference between beloved and loved. And I had to look this up. And some places say, well, it's, just, it's pretty much the same thing. It's synonymous. It's, it's a little bit different. The biggest difference is the value. I love pizza. Pizza is not beloved. Okay? I love a lot of things. I love horses. My horse is beloved by me, though. I put value, I put weight, I put, I put special meaning on something that is personal. Love can be a passionate thing, but being beloved is more than just a passionate feeling. It's a, it's a worth. It's something that we assign specialness to. Okay? 
in the Bible, Israel was considered beloved by God. Deuteronomy 7, 6 says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all people on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. We know throughout the Bible, as we see, starting with Abraham, Israel was chosen. They were valued. They were special. The rest of the Bible, the, the Bible does not talk about all the other people that were here on the earth, that had peopled the earth, unless they were enemies of Israel. God loved Israel. They were special. They had a special value to him based on the faith of Abraham. Solomon was also considered beloved by God. 2 Samuel 12, 24 to 25 says, Then David confronted his wife Bath comforted his wife Bathsheba, and he went to her and made love to her. She gave birth to a son, and they named him Solomon. The Lord loved him. And because the Lord loved him, he sent word through Nathan the prophet to name him Jedediah. He was special. He was held out as special from the very beginning by God. And though Solomon had his issues too and he had his problems, he was beloved of God. He was, he was blessed by God and God gave special, special worth to him. The one we know the most when we think about the loved is this passage. This is out of Matthew 3, 16 and 17. It says, After he was baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and settling on him. And behold, a voice from the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Beloved is what God calls Jesus. That's special. That's a special place. Beloved. That's a special beloved there. Now in the New Testament, as we look in, in the New Testament here, you're going to see that as believers in Christ, we are also separated out to that station of being of more worth, of special worth. Not that God loves anyone less or anyone more, but we have a special role, a special place. John 1, 12-13, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor the will of a man, but of God. God specifically chose his followers, his believers. And they're special. They're very special to him. That's us. Romans 8, 15 says, The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And to him we cry, Abba, Father. We are celebrating some very special people today in our church. Jan and Harold's marriage, Jan and Jackie's birthdays, the fact that we have been blessed, whatever age you are, if you've been in this church for your whole life, it hasn't been as long as they've been here. Think about that concept. They've loved you before you were born, and they loved every child that ever came into this building. It's special. And because of that, we are celebrating them because they are special to us. Very special. When I first started coming up to this church 11 years ago now, that's a long time coming up when I was just coming up every other week, I guarantee when I walk into this door, I guarantee two things. Number one, there was a hug waiting for me, or two or three, coming in the door right off the bat. Number two, when worship songs were sang, I could hear people sing. And that made me happy, and it made me feel comfortable, and it made me feel like God was in this building. And that comes from our elders leading us that direction. And as the world's generations fall apart, we got to remember not to let that happen to the generations behind us because we have a great cloud of witnesses in front of us showing us how to do it right. We are beloved by God as followers of Him. 1 John, again, this is John speaking, and he, if you want to hear about love, you read something John wrote. 1 John 3, 1 and 2. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. This is why love is not in the world, because they don't understand God's love. And this is why sometimes people look at us and don't understand us. Why are you happy? Why aren't you afraid? 
I had an administrator at my school when I got out of the hospital say, well, weren't you ever afraid of dying? I said, no. All I could think about was, I wonder who's going to take care of my wife. No. Other than that, I'm ready. If God calls me, I'm ready to go. Whatever. I'm not afraid. I don't live in fear. And the world loves to amplify fear and minimize love. And that's not the way God intended it. So we as Christians have that, if we have a true understanding of God's love, then it's our responsibility to be a reflection of that. It's our responsibility to be more than the world. So do we love? Do we really love? 1 Corinthians 13, 1-6. This is the love verse. And this is the verse that I put in today because we all know these verses. Um, we actually have something. I think in our bathroom we've got something that talks about love. It's on the wall. These are the love verses that everybody knows. And these are the ones that will show up in weddings. And these are that kind of stuff. And these, yes, they mean a lot between two people. There's a specialness there. But it's also the love that God has for us. And think about it in that description. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 6. If I speak in, in the tongues of men and angels, but I do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes. And always perseveres. So the question is, do we love like this? Now we can love our family. Most of the time, that's kind of easy. Sometimes, I'm sisters but sitting back here. Sometimes not so much, but most of the time, we love each other. But Jesus says, don't just love those who love you. Love your enemies. Love everyone. So now the question is, is that a definition of us? Are we patient, kind? Are we not proud? Are we self-seeking? Are we easily angered? Look at all this list of things. That's a hard standard to live up to, isn't it? There's a lot of things here that are hard to stand up to. It's important enough that Jesus said murder and, and calling someone a fool were exactly the same. It's that important. We can't minimize the fact that we are meant to be a reflection of God's love. That we are meant to love the way we have been loved. We can't minimize that fact. We can't take that and shrink it down into the world's view and say that's good enough. It's not. Sacrificial love means you love no matter what. You love when people are unlovable. You love the ones that don't deserve it. You know, that's us. They don't earn it. Well, that's us. We've received, so we should be willfully giving it out. So let's go to an application on this now. An application on how do you love? How are we meant to love? How are we meant to build on this, this love that God started with us? How are we supposed to set this up? Now there's one book that's very, very short in the Bible. I could read the whole book to you right here and be just fine. This is the book of Jude. Jude 17 through 19. You notice it's not Jude 1, 17 through 19. That's because Jude is one chapter. Jude 17 through 19 says, But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you, In the last time there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. Wow. But you, beloved, Jude is talking to believers here. Okay? Anybody know who Jude was? He identifies himself as the brother of James, but James is the brother of Jesus. So Jude himself is saying, you are my beloved. I love you. And you need to remember you need to remember that 
in the last time, there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. Boy, do we got to be careful. In this world right now, where we are, we have to be very careful because the world is full of that. It's full of mockers. It's full of people that are turning away from God and turning to themselves. And you know what? Not only is it full of those people, but they're the most popular. They're the most famous. They're the wealthiest. They're gaining unimaginable worldly acclaim and worldly wealth by being ungodly. That's a scary thought. The benefit in this world is not for following Jesus. The benefit in this world, according to the world standard, is to go the other direction. Now looking at that, under all these things we see about the love of God, God loved us enough to create us. God loved us enough that He formed us in the womb. God loved us enough that He sent His Son for us. And yet, as the world goes, they're turning away from God. Going the opposite direction and rewarding its... The world is rewarding itself for being ungodly. That is a scary thing. And in, in addition to that happening, it's easy to draw us into that too. Our human nature naturally leads us to sin. And it doesn't matter that you go to church on Sunday. That's not enough. We can all go through a list of theologians, preachers, apologists, some of the most knowledgeable Christians in the world that have fallen. And they have fallen hard and they have fallen far because they had much and they threw it away. And that's a hard fall. And in addition to that, they take people with them when that happens. Which is just terrible. When we see someone with any kind of authority that has people that they're leading, even if they're leading them in the right direction, and then that leader falls, some people fall with them. I'm seeing that in that, in that church my daughters. There are people there that have stopped coming to church now. The church itself is not made up of a pastor in a building. The church is made up of everybody sitting here. I can be replaced. I'm just part of the church. I'm a member of the church. That's it. So if I fell and I disappeared from here, I would, I would hope that everybody else came back because this is the church, and the church should build on itself. It should, we should build each other up. We should support each other. That love that we have should really extend personally to each other as a church. And it's easy for the world to try and drag us down. It's easy for the world to kick us when we're down. And it's easy for us to follow the world. That's the easiest thing. I haven't seen the statistics yet, but I'm going to look them up. I haven't seen it in our church, thank God. COVID has killed attendance in buildings of churches. I know of pastors locally who have lost their congregation because they were forced for a while not to come to church and nobody came back. Well, how deep is the love at that point in time? Yeah, we've got this phone up here. We put this on Facebook every week for those that can't make it here. That's no substitute. That is no substitute for sitting next to each other, for sharing each, with, in fellowship with each other, for spending time together. That is no substitute. It's substitute for the world. That's why we have those keyboard warriors out there that can fight battles without ever having to look somebody in the eye. They can throw all sorts of nasty things out because they realize the guy that will poke them in the nose for it is not sitting there with them. Distant stuff like that, that's comfortable. But it's not right for us as Christians. We are meant to be building and growing and getting stronger in the love of God in this place. And then from this place in this community. And from this community into this state and from the state into the country, from the country into the world. That's who we were meant to be. And we've lost sight of that. As Christians, we have lost sight of what we are, what we are meant to be. And if you look in the book of Revelations, I didn't put the verse up here. But Jesus talking to one of the churches in the book of Revelation says what? I have this against you. You have forgotten your first love. You started right. But you forgot. You lost it somewhere along the line. And we're going to make a change in this world. We have to go back to where we started. 
We have to go back to where we started. We have to go back to Sunday school with kids in that Sunday school learning about Jesus. We have to go back to our VBS was awesome this year. But we need to be more than that. We need to keep building on that. That's throwing a rock in a pond. It's got nice little ripples, but wouldn't it be great to be throwing rocks every day and watching waves instead of ripples? We need to be spending more time with each other in fellowship, in Bible study. We need to be spending more time in the Word ourselves to build ourselves. And this is what Jude says next. I've got Jude 17 through 19 here. Let's go to what Jude actually says should be done. Here's the application. In Jude 20 through 23, everything in black here is a, is, a, is a command. This is what we're supposed to be doing. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking forward to the mercy of, Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Okay, so here's the commands. Number one, build. Build on the foundation. Jesus said you look like a fool if you build a foundation and can't finish the building. Everybody will laugh at you. We have the foundation laid out before us. That foundation was laid out by Christ. That foundation was laid out by the early fathers of the early church. That foundation has been laid out by generation upon generation upon generation. And as I said, we have a good foundation right here. We have foundational members, people that started this church from the very beginning and led us in the right direction. But if we don't build on that now, younger generations, if we're not building on that, that building falls down. We've all seen the farmhouses, right? How long does it take if somebody stops living in a house before the house just collapses on itself? And it's not that anything, it's not that there's not maintenance going on. I don't do a whole lot of maintenance on the house I'm living in right now. But just the simple fact that it is occupied, and it is lived in, and it is used, keeps it going. Some of us live in houses that are pretty old. But they're sound, because there's someone living there. The church is the same way. When we stop building on our foundations, the building will crumble. <coughs> And I can, you can drive around this church and see the buildings that are empty. They used to be churches. And you can see that in every town in America. That's a, sad, that's a sad fact. And that is a fact. I do not know of a single place in the United States that I can't find an abandoned church. England. We had some, uh, there was a pastor in uh, here that he and his wife were missionaries to England for a very long time. And they said, you see all those grand cathedrals, those giant things, those giant, beautiful buildings that were built up, all the stained glass and the huge ceilings and all those things? He said, they're empty on Sundays. The building's there, but nobody's in it. <coughs> so, how's that a church? So we build on our foundations. First one's building ourselves up. Secondly, we need to be praying in the Spirit. The Bible says... You don't get because you don't ask. You don't have because you don't ask for it. You don't pray for it. We do this prayer list. Everybody comes in and shares the things that are on their heart. That's awesome. We share that prayer list. It's out there on Facebook. If you want a paper copy, we do that. We do these things, but the intention is not that we only mention it on Sunday and forget it until next week. God's intention is that we are praying consistently and constantly praying for God. And when we pray to God and we ask these things in, in His Son's name, He will answer. So again, look at our country, look at where we are, do you like it? I don't. What are you doing about it? Well, it says right here, pray in the Spirit. That's first. Be praying about it. Go to God and say, God, this needs to change. We talked last week about the fact that I think God's discipline is about to fall on our country. I think it is. And we need to be praying about that. We need to pray that people listen to the discipline, and we need to pray that we survive the discipline. We come out the other side. But we need to be praying. The third thing mentioned here is keep yourselves in the love of God. Abide in me and I will abide in you. 
keep yourself there. Jane and I were talking this week. We did a little we did another podcast, and she mentioned it there. One of the things that's really good to get yourself into the Word for the day is to start in the morning in the Word. Set your mind on that first. And then your day will progress as if that's where your mind is. Doesn't mean you can't pray at night. Pray at night, pray in the middle of the day, pray wherever you can. But get into your Word and set your mind on that. That's abiding in God. The next thing it says is we need to look forward to the fact that God's mercy is on us. We need to recognize our salvation for what it is. We need to recognize it. We need to honor it. And we need to understand what that sacrifice was. Looking forward to what that means. As that passage we said before, some we don't know even know what we're going to become. We're going to be completely remade. I had to look at that picture back there for a while before I saw Janet and Harold. Guess what? In heaven, I'll recognize them, but they probably won't look like they look today either. We're all going to change. God has, God has got something in plan for us that is greater than we can even imagine. Keep that in your mind. Keep that in your head. And then in dealing with the rest of the world, we have to have mercy on those who are doubting, those that are challenged. We don't condemn, we don't outlaw, we don't judge. That's God's job. God does that. We are meant to have mercy on those. If someone is challenged or doubting, we should be supporting them, building them up. Inside the church and out. That's our job. That's not a, if you want to. That's a job. That's something we're called to do. I love this next one in verse 23. It says, save others, snatching them out of the fire. Snatching them out of the fire. If you know someone who is taking their life to hell, because there's your options. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's heaven, period. Go through Jesus, that's it. There is no other option. There is nothing else you can say about that. But guess what? The only alternative is hell. There are two options. There's heaven, there's hell. That's it. There's nothing in between. There's nothing, well, I'll just take... Yeah, the little level of something. No, it's heaven and hell. That's it. So if someone is not going to heaven and you know them, it says snatch them out of the fire. Grab a hold of them. Pull them out. Snatch someone out and pull them out of that fire. Rescue someone who is burning. If they can smell the sulfur, you need to be pulling them out. And lastly, it says, and on some have mercy with fear. There are some that we won't be able to snatch from the fire. God can, but sometimes we can't. Sometimes there are things we can't do. We still need to have mercy on those people and understand God loves you even if you don't love yourself. God loves you even if you intend to go to hell. God loves you whether you know it or not and whether you care or not. There's a saying I read a long time ago, and I've used it myself, was teenagers. I looked at them and I said, you know, God loves you and so do I, and there ain't nothing you can do about that. I won't stop loving you, and God won't stop loving you, no matter what you do. His judgment, his righteous judgment will come in the end, but God loves you. There's a song that sometimes when I'm in, the, in Sunday morning, I, I got headphones on because... I love my wife, but she's writing or she's typing or she's doing something and everything's kind of a distraction to me when I'm focused. And I put headphones on, I put music on, that doesn't distract me. I don't know. But if she does that, it drives her crazy. She can't handle having that in the background. That's why headphones. But I was listening to a song. There was a, I think it was a country song that came on today when I was listening to the, the Christian songs on there. And talked about a man who was praying over a meal in a restaurant and the guy said, haven't you heard God's dead? Why are you bothering? And he said, oh, you're going to meet him someday. Whether you want to or not, it doesn't matter. Eventually, you're going to come face to face with God. And he then went on to say how he prayed for him, and later on that man realized, yeah, sooner or later, I'm going to. We have to have mercy on those that we can't save too. We don't ever write somebody off. That doesn't happen. 
That's not our job. God's judgment is coming and everyone will stand face to face with God and they will be judged on what they do today. That's not going to change. That's never going to change. That's an absolute. As much as the sun comes up in the east right now, the time will come when we're all going to stand face to face with God. That won't change. But right up until the last breath and the last beat of your heart, God gives you the opportunity to come to Him, recognize Him, and to fall into His arms and repent your sins and say, Hey, I need you. I cannot do this alone. Right up until the last beat. And it doesn't matter what you have done up until that last beat. It does not matter. Because God's love perseveres and is there always. So if there's anybody here who has not felt that love yet, who has not understood the love that God has for us, if you have not surrendered your life to God, knowing that that is the only way to get yourself out of hell, that is the only way to live your life today, that is the only way you will understand the depth and the breadth and the width of God's love. If you haven't gotten to that point yet, I want you to pray about that. I want you to think about that. I want you to talk to someone about that. I want you to consider opening your heart up to God. Turn it over to Him. Become one of His beloved. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for this day as we gather together and celebrate love. We celebrate birthdays. We celebrate anniversaries. We celebrate all these things. Lord, but we especially today celebrate our salvation and celebrate the love that You had for us. Because not only, Lord, did you send your son for us, but you put us in this place, in this time. In this moment in time, in this moment in history, we are standing where we are standing because of what you did intentionally. You said today in the Psalms that every day of our life is in your, written in your book. Every step in our lives are written down. And Lord, those steps have brought us here today right now. And I'm so grateful, Lord, that we have everyone gathered here today. I'm grateful, Lord, for everyone who might be listening online. That you have given us the opportunity to become who you want us to be. You have freely and willfully offered the blood of your Son. I ask, Father, that you open our eyes to that, to that love that you have. Open our hearts to that love. Not only to receive it, but also to give it. Because right now, Lord, more than any other time in history, I believe, the world needs your love. Father, bless us and keep us and protect each and every one of us. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.